much for today, God, and I thank you for everyone in this room, God, right now, and I just pray over the, um, the message, God, that we would be open to hear it, and um, we would get whatever you would want, want to give to us today, God, and I just pray for this day, and in Jesus' name, amen. You again, praise team. You did a great job as always. We're very delighted and blessed to have today a young lady from uh, River Road Church, which is just down the street. Her name is Dawn Spicer, and she works there with, I think, in the women's women's uh, ministry. And uh, so, please give her a very good welcome for Rebar Christian Academy. Let her know that you appreciate. It. Thank you. Good morning. I'm excited to be here with y'all, but I have not been excited the whole time as I was preparing. Um, I have to be honest with you and tell you that um, a sweet friend of mine that is actually a teacher here asked me to come talk to y'all. And at first I pretty much said, yeah, no, um, because it's a little intimidating to talk to a group of teenagers, in my opinion. I have two at home. And um, they really have no filter. <laughs> and I'm used to talking to women. And so women have uh, mastered what I call the face of encouragement. So when you're looking out and you're talking to these women, no matter if they think you're crazy or not, they're going to go, you know, and be like, yes, yes, praise the Lord. But a lot of times, you precious teenagers, <laughs> or at least my two, I'll say, when I'm talking to them, they're looking at me like I'm a nut. And so um, I was just a little bit intimidated, um, but the Lord said to me, Dawn, you have a story. And you have a story that can encourage, um, can speak to even teenagers. And so today, as I speak to you, um, I hope that you hear the heart of Jesus Christ above my words. Um, and so I'm going to share a little bit of my journey, which is an interesting one, to say the least. Um, just a little bit of my background. Uh, I have a husband, Jeremy, of 18 years, and we have 16-year-old identical twin boys. Um, and I did bring, yes, I did bring a picture. And um, I, uh, they asked me if I could put their number on the picture as well. <laughs> And I uh, said, no, no, because they were like, please let them know we're, I'm single. Um, but you have to get through this mama bear to get to my boys. But those are my boys, and most of the time they are sweet, I guess. But girls, you know how boys are. Um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say about that. So that is, that is my home. Um, but... Let's get down to business now. I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I grew up just down the street in Virginia Beach. I grew up in a church just down the street, First Baptist Norfolk. And um, I grew up in a, a, just a quaint little home. I had two older sisters who um, will tell you today that as a child growing up, I was every bit of the spoiled brat baby that a youngest child is. Uh, but I, I hope I've grown out of that at this point. I don't know. But every Sunday I would go to church with my dad who taught Sunday school. We'd go early and it was something I looked forward to each week. It was my time with my dad. Um, and I'd go and get his, his class prepared with him. I'd get his coffee ready for him. And so that's fond memories that I have from growing up in church. I had fond memories of going to church camp and all of those fun things that I looked forward to every year. At the age of seven, uh, I busted in on my mom in the bathroom. And I said, I need you to tell me about Jesus. And she politely asked me to wait until she got out of the shower to, to share that information with me. And so I waited and she shared with me who Jesus was. And on the very next Sunday, I, I walked proudly down the aisle, excited in my pink Bermuda shorts. Do y'all even know what Bermuda shorts are? I don't know. Are they back in style? I'm not sure. No, never. I had pink ones at seven, okay? Give me a break. But... I walked down the aisle and I accepted Jesus into my heart with everything that my seven-year-old self could do. And my happy little life went on. At the age of 14, I came home from summer camp, one of those memories that 
um, I looked forward to each year, and everything was different in my house. The peace and comfort of my home had left. My parents divorced, and my pretty little life changed drastically. I was thrust into a different life that I never expected um, or thought that I would live, and I was balancing between two parent households, two people that at that time did not like each other very much. And so I was most of the time walking on eggshells just trying to make everybody happy. Thus began years and years of people pleasing and just desiring for everybody to like me, desiring to be the cool kid, and in addition to that, being a little boy crazy. I'll admit it. Um, all I wanted to do was find a Prince Charming that was gonna rescue me. And just a little side note, fast forward 10 years, because I don't know if you're like me, but I like to know what's gonna happen at the end of a book or at the end of a show, so that whatever mess is going on in the middle of it, I feel okay about it because I know the happy ending. Um, my parents, 10 years after they divorced, came back together and healed from many, many hurts and are now remarried um, back together. And so it's just a beautiful picture. Yeah. Uh, but it's a beautiful picture of the redeeming love that we have in a savior who can redeem absolutely anything. But in my teenage years, which by the way, I had several friends that graduated from right here at GCA and they are still very dear friends to this day. But in those teenage years, uh, from growing up in church, I knew just the way to act. And I knew just the right words to say when those Sunday school questions came. The old saying, walk the walk, talk the talk. I could definitely talk the talk, but I certainly was not walking the walk at that point. I was not living out my faith. I was not allowing the Lord to have all of me. I allowed friendships. I allowed boys. I allowed whatever activities, whatever there was, to try and fill me up, to make me feel good. And so it was this roller coaster of when a boy would break up with me, I crashed and burned and thought I was worthless. When a friend didn't want to hang out with me anymore or started a rumor about me, I felt worthless. And on and on and on, and it was just a, a terrible roller coaster for my dramatic self because I was quite the dramatic girl. Some would say I'm still a little dramatic. Maybe I am. Mm. But um, amidst the boys that ran for the hills because of my crazy self when I was in college, one stuck around and asked me to marry him. And that was um, Jeremy, who I'm still married to today. Um, yes. <laughs> However, yesterday I told him in the morning that um, I didn't know if I was going to be able to talk nice about him because I was quite angry with him yesterday morning. I had to talk to the middle schoolers yesterday. And so the night before last, I was a little nervous, you know, and I really just wanted a good night's sleep. Just wanted to sleep good, wake up feeling re refreshed. And my dear, dear husband is a sleepwalker. So I woke up about 2 o'clock yesterday morning to my husband standing in the bed holding on to the headboard, jumping up and down. <laughs> so I was a little upset yesterday, because as you can imagine, that wakes me up, frightens me a little bit, and then it takes me three hours to fall back asleep. But in spite of that, he is wonderful. And um, three years after we were married, we had those boys I showed you. But here's the deal. All I wanted in life, was to be a wife and a mom. I wanted that Prince Charming to come rescue me, and then I wanted to have the babies and just be a wife and a mom and just have the perfect little family. But that didn't complete me, and it never will. And so for years after, as I was struggling to be a, a mom of twin boys um, and a wife, I continued to feel empty and there was a giant void in my heart. Um, I lived empty until about six years ago when my life practically crashed and burned before my eyes because I hadn't chosen 
to surrender my life to the Lord and allow the Lord to be the one to come in and rescue me. I instead was looking to a human and babies to do that for me. But I continued to, to have my put, to put together self and I knew just how to walk my perfect little family into church, you know, and take the cute little pictures for the Insta and all of those things to make it look like I was happy and great and for everybody to like me. Um, I even taught Bible study. I stood up on a stage and led worship, but I still had that giant void. You see, there's no sport that you can be an all-star at. There's no boy, there's no girl, there's no stellar GPA, sorry teachers, but there's nothing that's going to complete you outside of the heart of Jesus Christ. Next week, probably even tomorrow, maybe this afternoon, you will still be void and you will be still looking for the next greatest thing. Six years ago, I made a choice to do something that wrecked me and almost destroyed my entire family. It left my husband on our bathroom floor so heartbroken that he could not get up and the rest of my life in com complete disarray. It was a selfish choice that simply came from not surrendering my life to the Lord with total completeness but instead choosing the here and now of something that made me feel good and important in a moment. Yet when it all crumbled six years ago, when it blew up and everybody ran for the hills, the only thing that was left in the rubble of my mess was the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. And at that moment, I fell on my face. And I said, Jesus, I need you. There is nothing, there is nothing that's going to fill me up, and I'm ready. So at 35 years old, I finally did it. I finally surrendered it all and said, there is nothing apart from you. I believe your truths. I trust in your truths, and I want to walk that out. When I finally confessed and, and surrendered to the Lord, these last six years have been some hard years, but they have been the most rewarding years for me because there's freedom in surrender. It's hard, but there's freedom. I want to read a passage to you from Luke, Luke chapter 15. You've probably heard it before. It's the first seven verses. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. One sinner confessing their sin sets off a party in heaven. I want to be a part of that party. God's concerned about the lost who are going to admit their lost and turn back to him. He wants us to put our sinful lives behind us, leave our mess behind us, and follow after him. He wants us to rest in him because he loves us so much. And like these sheep, we wander about until we hear his voice. A friend of mine lived in Iceland for a time. And one weekend, they were camping at the bottom of a cliff at a waterfall. I just think that that's probably a beautiful sight. But in the spring and summer there, the shepherds let their sheep out in these fields at the top of the cliff to just graze. And as they were just enjoying their camping trip, my friend and her family and uh, the people that brought them, a sheep just fell over the cliff and died right in front of them. So you can imagine they were pretty startled by that. 
But one of the gentlemen that was with them said, yeah, that happens all the time. I'm like, why don't they put up a fence? But he went on to tell them that sheep are so single-minded, they're so focused on what they're doing at one time that they lose sight of everything else. So most of the time as they're filling their bellies, as they're grazing in the field, they're, they're so focused on that that they don't realize that they're about to fall off that cliff to their death. I kind of think we're like sheep. We can be so single-minded, we can be so fixated on the one thing that's in front of us that feels good in the moment, that we don't realize how close we are to falling right off that cliff. So when the winter's approaching, the shepherds come back out to the fields to retrieve their flocks. And as they gather the, sh the sheep, one shepherd goes into this area where all the sheep are, and he begins to sing. And as he sings, specific sheep will come to him. And they do this because during the winter, as the, their shepherd takes them into the warmth, and every day as they feed them, the shepherd sings to them. And as he sings to them, they eat and he pets them. So when they come to get them, those specific sheep recognize their shepherd because they associate his voice with comfort and warmth and nourishment and hope. And I think in the same way we can know our shepherd's voice. When we surrender our hearts to our good shepherd, when we study his word, when we have a daily relationship with him, we begin to recognize his voice because it brings us peace and it brings us nourishment and it brings us eternal hope that nothing, absolutely nothing else can do. I think we greatly underestimate how much Jesus loves us because we associate love with our human eyes and hearts. A lot of times that comes from whatever our background is. See, for me as a teenager, I associated love with trying to please others. And it was just a hard job to always do, to earn that love. We don't have to do that with our incredible Savior. It says in scripture, his love is unfailing. His love reaches to the heavens. His love is deeper than the ocean. He loves us so much. As I was thinking about how to kind of bring this all together, like what, what to, to say, I was thinking about what I would tell my 16-year-old self if I lived right now. And then I thought, well, I have two 16-year-olds at home. What do I talk to them about all the time? And that is, I can find it. This little thing right here. And so I thought, hmm, what do I tell them all the time? Stop scrolling this mess all the time and talk to our Savior. Don't check out. I'm telling myself the same thing because I'm sure you're told it all the time by teachers, by your parents, and whoever else. Don't check out. I'm telling you telling you something that I tell myself all the time because I can get caught up in this too. I can get caught up in social media and all of the things on there. I don't necessarily do the YouTube or whatever, the video streaming, I don't know. But with the amount of time that we spend on those things, it, be it can become our truth speaker. And when we allow that to become our truth speaker, it goes straight to our hearts and we open the door to the lies of the enemy. And when we begin to believe the lies of the enemy, we start to not trust the promises of our God. So are you looking down at this thing more than you are looking up to him. I read a quote the other day. It said, if your heart has been cap captivated by the culture rather than captured by Christ, you will seek to feed your own desires and your own flesh. It happened to me and it can happen to you. We have to let the promises of Christ 
capture our hearts. We have to consume ourselves with his truths above anything else. Understand you're created for a purpose. And that purpose that he's created specifically for you is the only thing that will satisfy you completely. It took me till I was 35 to figure that out. I wasted a lot of life. You can choose that now because you have a great life ahead of you. I can tell you what the, done, the Lord has done in my life in the last six years has left me continually studying this, grabbing this every single day before I grab anything else before I grab that little device. And because I consume myself with those truths, it causes me to want to shout to the rooftops how incredible our God is. My children, when I start, I want to say preaching to them, but I don't want to preach. When I start talking to them at the dinner table or whatever it is, they're like, yes, Mom, we know. God loves us. But I can't help it because I've chosen to consume myself with his truths above anything else. Ask yourself this. Does the presence of our God so permeate through you that others see Jesus before they see anything else? Or is it just that churchy lingo to you? I read this. This is a, a beautiful... I want to... I'll speak in a minute. Um, <laughs> I was having a hard time trying to figure out how to wrap this up. And this is how beautiful our God is. He's known what I was going to say to y'all. And so yesterday when I was in my time with the Lord, this is my devotional and it's, I've used it for, the pages are falling out because I've used it for three years um, because I absolutely love it. And yesterday's devotion aligned exactly with what I had to say this morning. And so I felt like reading this to you wrapped it all up for you. And so I just want to read a short little bit here. It says, you and I always don't li live, oh, you and I don't always live what we say we believe. There is often a disconnect between our confessional theology and our street level functional theology. There is often a separation between on the one hand, the doctrines we say we have embraced, and on the other hand, the choices we make and the anxieties that we feel. One of the places where disconnect exists for many of us is the biblical teaching about eternity. We say we believe in the hereafter. We say that this moment in time is not all there is. We say that we are hardwired for forever. But often we live with the compulsion, the anxiety, and the drivenness of eternity amnesiacs. We get so focused on the opportunities, responsibilities, needs, and desires of the here and now that we lose sight of what is to come. The fact is that you cannot make sense out of life unless you look at it from the vantage point of eternity. If all God's grace gives us is a little better here and now, if it doesn't finally fix all that sin had broken, then perhaps we have believed in vain. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. There has to be more to God's plan than this world of sin, sickness, sorrow, and death. There has to be more than the temporary pleasures of this physical world. Yes, there is more. And when you live like there's more to come, you live in a radically different way. I hope you walk out of here today having encountered Jesus Christ. I hope you walk out of here today knowing just a little bit more about how much he loves us and how much he desires for us to walk with him. And maybe if you find yourself in a place where you're like, I just made a bad choice. I'm in a pinch. You can talk to me. I'd be happy to encourage you. Let's pray. Lord, I just Thank you for this time today. I thank you for the listening ears and hearts of every single one of these students. And God, I just thank you for Jesus. Lord, I just pray.
pray that these students understand how much you love them. And Lord, that your purpose for their lives is better than any thing that is in the here and now. We love you so much, and we praise your holy name. very powerful message. I hope it spoke to you because it certainly spoke to me. And the center of Dawn's message was keep your eyes focused on the Lord. And we can make it through just about anything and she's got some tough things she's gone through. Now before we before we dismiss today, let's take a minute and pray for our seniors. Uh, they have a trip today they're going on and they're going to be leaving right after school. So I would like to end our chapel by praying for them and praying for their safety and praying for a great trip. So let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for uh, our seniors. I pray that you would be with them as they travel to Pennsylvania this afternoon. Lord, be with Mr. Wilson as he drives the bus and keep them safe. Uh, and Lord, and most importantly, I pray that while they're in Pennsylvania and while they're at the camp, that you'll use uh, this time to bring them together or to draw them closer to you. And I pray that everything that they do will honor you while they're there, Lord, help them have a great time. Keep them safe, both coming and going. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Thank you, guys.